Thanks, Jody. When I decided to dedicate a sermon to humor, it felt like a treat, kind of an indulgence. And I like to think I know why. It's because I like, I like to think I know what's funny. I was aware that I did not know why something was funny, which intrigued me. That was part of the motivation, which is really the sneaky excuse for the sermon. But like the Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart said about pornography, I may not know exactly how to define it, but I know it when I see it, right? We all know what's funny when we see it. Also, Jerry Johnson, one of our building leaders and long-term members, at one point called my collection jokes corny, and I've never really forgiven him. <laughs> so this is my chance to try to prove him wrong. In a sermon about humor, I, I felt the need to be funny without feeling like it was a comedy routine, like I'd said and decided to look at humor from the perspective of a social scientist and use jokes as examples of what humor is and what it reveals. Essentially, I wanted to keep consistent with my pattern of overanalyzing spiritual matters to the point that they lose their magic. That's funny, or designed to be. In my effort to over, overanalyze the wonder of what humor is, two questions came to light. First, how does humor work? Essentially, what makes something funny? And secondly, why is there such a thing as humor? What function does it have? What evolutionary advantage did it give us? What, what, why is it there? It feels redundant to say that laughing is correlated with our joy and happiness. We kind of already instinctively know that. Connecting laughter to happiness is nearly the equivalent of saying that food tastes good or that beauty is appealing, right? You're kind of built in. Why does the simple question, if love is blind, why is long lingerie so popular can bring such cheeky joy? What makes something funny is this great and in a great and a complicated question. And the funny thing about humor, not ha ha funny, but sort of odd funny, is that we don't know what's funny about something before we find ourselves chuckling about it. Right? We don't know what's funny about something when it's funny. The experience of what's funny not only generally comes before we have an awareness of why it's humorous, it actually has to. Right? If we know what's funny about something, it's not funny anymore. Once we know what's funny, it isn't funny. And I think that that's just kind of just cool. I hadn't quite known that when funny is put under the microscope, it's not funny anymore. Reverend Iona Forgig suggested in her sermon on laughter that analyzing humor is a little like studying how a frog works. It can be done, but the subject tends to die in the process. I was recently, for example, asked to give, an, uh, give uh, my friend Eric's cat a bath. We know lots of unexpected, embarrassing things can happen in the effort to bathe a cat, especially one that's not yours. My notes here instruct us to pause for a minute to allow for the comical images that might come to mind in bathing a strange cat or trying. You might quietly imagine me chasing the cat around an apartment, imagine water spilling all over the place or getting scratched while I'm reaching under the couch for the cat. As it turned out, none of that happened at all. In fact, the cat liked it a lot more than I expected. Good news for me, disappointingly not funny. Not until I add that you have no idea how hard it is to get those little hairs off your tongue. Funny, right? If you followed along with the joke, it's the twist of the expectations that we find the humor in. The scholars of comedy suggest that humor is connected to the experience we have on our brains, which are working hard to predict things in established patterns. That's how our brains work. They look for patterns, gets its own expectations challenged. That's part of what humor is. Part of why humor can't be studied is that it has to surprise us to some degree. Meaning a twist of expectation seems a part of the requirement of what's comical. So comedy always approaches 
us a little bit peripherally, right? It comes from the side as to what's funny, meaning that in comedy's DNA is a little bit of chaos. John Morell's book, Taking Laughter Seriously, he, he claims that humor is based on novelty and incongruity essentially suggesting that a big part of what's so funny is the liberating spirit, the elevating pleasure of having one's own expectations violated. Comedy is hardly physics, it's true, but I was struck by how discerning exactly what makes something funny is a little like the difficulty scientists having pinpointing the actions of an atom, right? The analysis is always a bit late. My father frequently talks, uh, tells this joke about the day his mother died in her sleep, my grandmother. He says she died, she turned 98 years old, and she was surrounded by three of her kids, which people respond, as they frequently do, with a comforting statement like, well, that's a nice way to go. And he adds this with a straight face before smiling, well, my sister's riding in her car didn't experience it that way. You almost can't help but chuckle at the surprise. It's liberating. However, when you chuckle at, of his audience has fully subsided, my dad will return, who's sitting right here, will return to the poignancy by saying, you know, even in, in a tragic accident, there really was something very blessed about that day. They were able to save her unborn baby. Twisted, but funny, right? She's 98 years old. Not for the sensitive, but funny. Sometimes what's funny is rooted not in a twist in content as much as connected to a twist in pace. Sometimes part of the comedy is dependent on our own experience and the pause of time it takes for us to get a joke. Here's one. He's so stupid he couldn't get water out of a boot if the directions were written on the sole. If you're first put off by the slur of someone's intelligence, if, and that's a fair thing to be critical of, the comedy of the joke mostly comes in the pause it takes to realize that to see the sole of a boot means to tip it over so that it's essentially facing down, employing gravity to remove the water. However, it's always more complicated than that humor is. Humor is not about timing exclusively or or about surprise, it's also subjective, right? It's also based on where we are in our lives and people. If someone happens to be sensitive to the idea that a stranger might be slurred for not being very smart, and that sympathy shifts away from our attention from the humor of the boot story to the sensitivity to that person, then the funny, the humor is removed from it entirely, right? Your focus has to be removed from the slur to get the joke, and the joy in that evaporates. We, of course, know that not every joke works the same on everyone, right? Comedy and, and, and physics are also similar in the way that we know the observer changes the joke, and that fact makes humor an inter interior experience to the receiver which is interesting, right? It's like art. Not everyone experiences it in the same way. I hadn't quite known that so directly either. What's hard about humor is that whether something is funny or whether it turns out to be sad or hurtful is complex, simply because what we find funny is silently or unconsciously fluid and contextual and relational and personal. So even if we know what makes something funny involves an unexpected twist, which we talked about in our mental perspective and expectations, the recipe involves too many parts to be predictable. You really can't predict what's going to be funny. Comics, professionals go on stage to work out material they think is funny to find out what actually other people think is funny. Even Saturday Night Live skits, which include top of the craft professionals, right? With no other agenda than half of funny and a week to vet the stories with each other as to what's funny. If you've watched the show, mostly it's not that funny. Only a little bit of it really is funny. So predicting what's comical and humorous is hard. 
because of this, if we're inclined to want to see a character brought down to earth, things as familiar as hum and humbling as watching someone try to steer a shopping cart with a broken wheel can be hilarious, right? You can imagine that being a really funny thing. However, if the same visual can draw more sympathy than laughter, if the person pushing the faulty wheel turns out to be a haggard mother pushing a shopping cart with three kids around her, right? Then we, our sympathy is derived. The variables in comedy are too difficult to predict. But if we can't predict when the magic of laughter will strike, we do know a little more directly about what functions it provide. And it's a lot. Humor gives us more than you would think. I think you'll be surprised. Even if it doesn't take a scientist to tell us that we're generally enjoy the people that we laugh with, right? Laughing with somebody is a elixir to the goodwill we feel with one another. It's a social lubricant is the first thing that comes up on the list of what humor does for us. Laughter is a bridge between people. It's frequently in, in employed as a conscious and unconscious tool in dissolving the uncomfortable situations where hostility and aggression can be high, right? Those famous presidential press club things where they all sort of take a whack at one another are part of that. And the other underlying theory around laughter is it like a smile, it profoundly dis, it disarms those who witness it, right? You smile at someone, it's a disarmingly peaceful creating moment. Laughter has the same thing. And it's, it's a bridge to warmth, closeness, and goodwill. It's a cue that we're supposed to be friends. But laughter not only reduces social tension, laughter literally heals us. As one source described it, when we laugh, our whole system dances, right? Laughter is the best medicine, as they say. And did you know that when studies have shown that when you laugh, whether it's contrived laughter or not, those in the study exhibited a measured decrease in blood pressure by as much as 35%. Another study showed that those who laugh on average more than four minutes a day extend their life by more than seven years. Okay, I made those statistics up, but I bet it probably felt good when you got the cat joke. My sermon notes here that I expected more than 65% of you loved that joke. That's see, Marith, and that's good. But she's always in that 35% anyway, so don't worry about it. If you can thank me for strengthening your immune system for laughing and relaxing your muscles, in fact, this sermon has probably improved your health for the rest of the day, and that I am not lying about. I would say you're welcome if we also know that sitting down is bad for you for about an hour and that the food at coffee hour is today high in saturated fats, so we'll call it a wash. In researching this sermon, I've read reports that suggest that half a minute of full hearty laughter is the same as three minutes of rowing. That stat I didn't make up. I actually did read that. What I couldn't seem to find was the joke that lives somewhere in there about how much it easier it is to laugh than to row, or for that matter, how many how few of us own a rowboat. As Dr. Henry Wheat Beecher said, mirth is God's medicine for a long life and everyone ought to bathe in it. Mirth is God's medicine for a long life and everyone ought to bathe in it. He died at 43, but I still think that it's right. <laughs> See, as wonderful as humor is, it can be pushed too far and it can be, and you can cross the line with it, right? And, and, I, and here we go. So laughter not only heals and is funny, it acts as a social lubricant, right? Humor also might be the most concise way to pass on information about culture and identity. It's very sharp and quick, right? I challenge you to more concisely express the nature of what it is to be a UU than I will with these three jokes. What do you get when you cross a Jehovah's Witness with a Unitarian Universalist? 
Someone who comes knocking at your door but isn't quite sure why. <laughs> Second joke. The real holy trinity for you use is reduce, reuse, and recycle. And did you hear about the outrage you use? Yeah, they're out burning question marks on people's lawns. <laughs> if you did not understand what it is to be a Unitarian Universalist, maybe some of our new people don't, that is as quick a description of who we are as anyone can provide. Ask yourself if you could provide more information about this crazy movement of ours more efficiently. Not, so, not to mention the fact that we generally have a pretty confident sense of ourselves enough to make fun of ourselves in that way, which is part of what it is to be a UU. So even if we don't know exactly what it is or how it functions, humor is a social lubricant. Humor takes the sting out of tragedy and the challenges we face in life to our fate. My father is great at this. There's an old Yiddish proverb too that says, what soap is to the body, laughter is to the soul. And no, that's not surprisingly not a lie. I think we've all felt laughter's cleansing and life renewing quality. I think that humor is to facing life's inherent challenges, right? Aging, all those things that just flat tires and everything else. Right, It is to what the pleasure is to tasting food, is to our need to eat, the pleasure of sex is to our need to procreate. Laughter is the response to the challenges we face in everyday lives. When life gets too intense, it is to laughter that helps us get a new perspective on things. And as Mark Twain said, tragedy plus time equals comedy. And that is so true. 15 years ago, comedian Chris Rock got in a heap of trouble for suggesting that the new trade, World Trade Center, which became the Freedom Tower, right, should, uh, in New York, should actually be titled, Ain't Ever Going In There Tower. <laughs> it was too soon, right? And he followed that up by saying, it, as its corporate sponsor, that it should be the department store Target. <laughs> too soon, right? I happen to think that's funny, but if you're, because it names that hard to say fear of the new building would be something that terrorists would want to attack and bring down. It's funny because when our most primitive level, we have a superstition around that kind of stuff. But you can easily see if you lost someone in the world to great tenors or you were particularly traumatized by that, how that's not funny at all right? Where you are sits with comedy. Humor, if we choose to see it, reveals our location and our soft spots, right? I would be remiss not to mention the power of comedy to stereotype and to slur. You can't pass that up. I want you to feel your body's response to me standing in church delivering the following joke. I'm doing this for the purpose of things, right? Those, FYI, are intentionally designed to express how humor can offend. What's better than a silver medal in the Special Olympics? Not qualifying. Painful, right? Painful. Comedy has the capacity to hurt. And that's where the spectrum, wherever you are in the spectrum of ow, you could even hate me for that joke. That's, I completely appreciate that. No matter where you are on that comedy, we have to know has that potential. So it's not a perfect solution to every problem, right? Where you are in your challenges and meets that story, right? Connected to people who have challenges, wherever you are on that is important. Likewise, when I was driving back from cleaning my friend's cat, I was, I, I was, I saw in a big growling truck, the little bumper sticker that said, black rifles matter. In witnessing that, I felt, I felt two things. I saw in myself an appreciation of the twist on black lives matter, but I also could feel how that position was so serious to me that I found it not funny and provoked anger in me, right? It has that 
capacity to just be so subtle. So the question of is one's face with regarding humor is, does the cutting, insightful, emperor has no close quality to it worth it? Humor unveils our social and ex existential position on things quite clearly. Our ability to, as the Brits say, take the piss out of ourselves, pardon the crude phrasing, is a visible sign to ourselves that we don't take ourselves too seriously. As the laughter expert John Morell phrases it, people who laugh, in particular laugh at themselves, are trusted to be humbler in moments of success and less defeated in times of trouble, and in general more accepting of the way things are. Now, I feel like a person of Irish heritage, I feel like I can tell the following joke, right? An Irishman walks past a bar. It happens. See, I really can't tell that joke if I'm not Irish, right? Deirdre might even be offended by that joke. Now, I can't, I can tell the Irish joke because I'm part of that culture I can't tell this joke. Why do Jewish football players always play defense? Because they're very good at getting the quarterback. I don't have a right to tell that joke, right? That's a joke that's not in my frame to tell, like the Special Olympics joke. We have to be careful with humor and how it cuts and how we use it. When people who study racism say you can't be racist without any structural power, there's a felt sense in that, and you can feel it in the jokes, right? You have to own it a little bit. Humor is a tool to remind us of our fragility, our weakness, our humanity. For me, humor is a gift and a tool to, dig, to deal frankly with the fact that tragedy is part of life. I walk away believing that humor is really only something that one can see out of the corner of one's eye. And for that reason, I believe humor has an almost magical, undefinable quality that I would put there at the same category of love and beauty. And I hadn't quite expected to find that in the start of this sermon. Amen. <laughs>